What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share the video, and make sure you leave a comment. You already know what it is, Big Sandy Chronicles. We're going back inside Big Sandy. I got a guest on today. I'm going to let him tell you who he is, what he's doing with his life, and we'll talk a little bit about how he ended up in Big Sandy and all of that good stuff. B, tell the people who you are, man, where you're from. Hey. Hello, everyone. My name is Bryant. Well, many people in the feds and in my hometown know me as B-Dub. Uh, I entered the feds around 99. Yeah, 1999, I entered the feds. Uh, I came in for a possession, a uh, convicted felon with a, a firearm. Yeah. And I received the 15-year uh, uh, minimum. Well, you know, you cop out to it. Um, my first spot was uh, USP Lewisburg. And um, from there, from Lewisburg, it was like six other joints after that. Um, Atlanta, Coleman, Big Sandy was my last USP before I ended in um, school kill media. Talk a little bit about that 15 years, right? Because there's a lot of young dudes out here right now, man, that are carrying guns. They don't realize, man, that when the feds grab you, they might say, hey, you're an armed career offender, right? And now your mandatory minimum is 15 years. Really, for a gun, it's zero to 10. But if you have this record, they say, guess what? Your mandatory minimum's 15. So you got 15 years on a cop out, right? Right. I copped out to 15 because others that went before me that didn't, got life. And I knew with my record, and it was violent, that the chances were I was going to get life and I just couldn't see a life sentence. So uh, 15 years, I counted the numbers and I said, I had to man up and, you know, do that 15, you know. Um, that's the thing. Uh, I never knew people get caught with a gun. You. you like, like you just said, you, I didn't do that 15 years for that particular charge. I did the 15 years for my history, which I, I guess now is illegal now. I think under the Jones law, I think it's called, they can no longer give out those sentences like that or guys are getting back. Is, is that the Jones? Well, it depends. I mean, if you're an armed career offender and you got a 922G, which is a felon in possession of a firearm, you can still be sentenced to 15 years. However, it depends on what your priors were. And the Jones case ended up getting shot down. It, it went through and then it got overturned. That was out of the Second Circuit. Um, so that's um, what it is. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, so, um, and prior to the, the 15 years I did, I always did state time. You know, I, I, I was in and out the system like, like many criminals. I went into a reformatory at 13 spent many four years in the reformatory. So that was the building of my my criminal career. And then from there, um, I went into the state system. So it, I, I was always in and out on skid bids, you know, uh, for shooting back then in the, you know, cause I'm a little up there in age. So back then it was like for shooting, you can get two years. So robberies, you know, you can cop out to these package deals before the feds started taking the gun cases. So I was already in terms of familiar with institutional, institutional and how to move, but the feds was a total different world. You know, and, and I mean, back when I came in, you didn't even go into population. I, like I said, I went to Lewisburg and the crazy thing about it, on, on, the, on the bus rides there, I was there with one guy named Joe, white boy Joe from, um, where is he from? He is an old timer, but he, he was telling me, he says, when you first get there, you go into the hole. They don't let nobody in population. So I went to the hole, but the crazy thing, Lewisburg is a, a prison that was built 1920. So the hole is like a dungeon and it's a dark, you know, they built the new hole now, but back then. So when they, when they was bringing me into the hole, they had to find a cell for me. These jokers, now mind you, I, I, I'm, I'm from the state, so pretty much the administration runs the institution. But now it's, the dynamics is different. So as they're, they're bringing me to the hole, they got me cuffed up. They're marching me to sell, asking the guy in the cell, would you take him? 
and dudes is looking out through the sun because Lewisburg's uh, uh, hole had they had this like this. It was like an old steel door with a little little bar thing where a guy could look out. So dudes was looking out as they was marching me from cell to cell, asking these dudes would they take me. And dudes, there was a lot of DC dudes there in the hole because DC had just got into it with the um, with some other group. I think so they had a lot of DC. Dudes. So they were saying no, no. So the, it in in the hole it was four floors. The hole had four floors. So they marched me from floor after the, and each floor had about. I think about 30 cells on each floor. So after they marched me through one tier, they went up and tried me through another tier. It was this dude from Brooklyn, a good dude. I forgot his name though. And he took me as a celly and they brought me in there. Uh, me and him politic. He said, when you go to, uh, what was it called then? Quad, I forgot. What it, was. It, was, it was like an orientation. After two weeks, they bring you out. You're in front of the warden the assistant warden, the captain, all uh, the sergeant, everybody in there. And they ask you information that they already got on you. They ask you, are you an informant? Where did you ever inform? And you say, no, yeah, whatever. And can you go on population? Do you have any enemies out here? And you tell them, no. Then they make you sign this paper to go out in population. And Let me ask you this, right? How mm -hmm. old were you when you were sentenced to 15 years? Oh, man. 30. 34. So you're 34. You sign this plea for 15 years. You're probably doing the numbers in your head. You're like, damn, man, I'm going to get out of prison when I'm like 46, 47. Is that what you were yeah. thinking? Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't even see that far. I ain't going to lie. I couldn't even see that far, man. And, 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 you know, I had lost my mother while I was there. And she was like the only real strong because all the other, uh, uh, Associates, I had everybody drops off, you know. Um, my so when I lost my mom's, so it, it was it was it was a real blow. But uh, Lewisburg feds quickly, you know. I caught on quick. I caught on real quick. Um, as far as you know, um, the hustle. Uh, the I mean. In the state where I was at, uh, white guys didn't walk around with their 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 SWATs. The, you know the Aryans didn't walk around, but in Lewisburg they was on their yard bare chest, you know, lifting weights. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's real. You know, uh, the cafeteria was eight hundred. I think they had Lewisburg had five serving lines, five serving lines. So I mean, the whole world and everything that ran. I mean, just being with different cultures from Washington to Florida to California. And see, this is what, what people don't understand. This is what makes the feds more dangerous than any. It's not a local universe. It's a universe, you know? So when I say local, I mean, if you in, in New York, you go into like upstate rate on me, and you know, New York state jails, you around your own homies. You're gonna know somebody from your borough there or whatever. So your culture is gonna connect. But in Lewisburg or feds in general, it, it, it's a different, it's a whole different dynamics. And you have to learn to, to adapt to people, you know, from DC, Detroit and everything. So, you know, it was, it, it, it was, it was crazy. Um, I worked in the kitchen. I got my, I got my job in the kitchen cooking. I learned everything that stamps the hustle. I mean, it, it, it was a it was a crazy experience. Um, from there, um, I want to stop. I you. think I, I want to stop you, and I want to talk a little bit about Lewisburg. You mm -hmm. were in Lewisburg when it was still dangerous, right? Yeah, I I, I think Lewisburg seen as la yeah, you can say that, but it it wasn't as bad as it was like in the early nineties. They had see prior to that, they had more cameras they put up, so they had more surveillance let me just put it like that they had more surveillance but the the danger yeah it was still bodies jumping and it was still the big house the, the officers still wear the jacket the big house lewisburg the big house they keep the tradition um the red top is still the red top yeah so it, it, it they still had the movie theater when i was there what was the most dangerous federal prison that you were ever in would you say big sandy 
Big Sandy. Eventually you leave Lewisburg, you go to these other prisons, but eventually you end up in Big Sandy, right? What's it like right. the first day when you come to Big Sandy? Let me just say, uh, okay, real quick. So I end up getting into it with the GDs in Lewisburg, stabbed the GD up in the back of the kitchen eight times. They had to fly him out. He lost the lung. I got shipped to Long Park, California, and from Long Park. Okay, but I got to Coleman, Florida, and stabbed another dude up in, in Coleman, Florida. That's when Coleman, I just acted up so bad. That's when they, they, they sent me. I had never heard of Big Sandy. I'm getting to it. Listen up. B, I want to stop you for a minute because people, sometimes they listen to these videos. They're like, oh, man, this dude this, did this, did that. I want people to know that I was in Big Sandy with you, and I want people to know that you were known for, you know, carrying that knife, man, and, and handling that business. So before we get there, why did you end up having to stab the GD dude in Lewisburg? I want people to know why these things happen in prison. Okay, um, so so basically, Shy town had just got there, and... He was working in the kitchen and the system that we had in the kitchen, we had a hustle system. We used to buy weight of boxes of chicken, everything from the supply room and the supply guy would ship it up and then we would hustle it in the kitchen. So we would sell like maybe 150 sandwiches in the kitchen. That was our hustle. That was our main thing. And we had a good thing going. We had a crew, me, C Murder from DC. It was a kid named C Murder. All of us, we were partners and we had a good thing. Shy town comes in there and he's a bully. So he's like, you know, pretty much thinking he can bully stuff. So there was a box of fish left. <laughs> Me and Green, I just don't about this. Anyway, but there was a box of fish. He decided to take it. And boom. So I confronted him and I explained to him what the system was, trying to deal with some man time, but he wasn't a, he wasn't on man time. So the, the shot caller, I explained the situation because the politics and, and, and the Fed system is you don't react. You try to follow the chain of command of, uh, of the politics. They have a shot caller. Each city has someone, maybe not a shot caller, but someone who's the more knowledgeable or the old head that they kind of, you know, kind of gets the group molded right. So I went to uh, Wood was the, sh uh, I think Wood was the shot caller from the GDs. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, it was, it, it, they didn't, they, they talked to Shy, but I guess Shy Town was just not having it. So um, he, with the room he worked in, I cleared the room out. There was a bunch of New York dudes in there and, and some DC dudes. One DC dude named Mo in there. So what I did was, the day I decided to hit Shy Town up for that box of fish, um, I cleared the room out. So I, I didn't want Shy Town to know because we had an argument. Excuse me, I'm sorry because it was so long ago. Me and him had words prior to the stabbing. So we had words. And so that's when I decided to uh, uh, hit him up. So before I did it, I told uh, everybody that was in the room that he worked in, because they, they worked in a certain room, there was no camera. I knew there was no camera in that room. So I told everybody, all the New York cats, the blood cats, I said, yo, tell what you call it. Don't make a scene, y'all just walk about it. The way Lewisburg Kitchen was is gates, gates. I had to get everybody on the other side of the gate. I didn't want no witness because I was already determined to kill Shy in that room. And I didn't want no witnesses. So I got everybody out there on the other side of the gate. So now I had scissors, 11 inch scissors. I had a half a scissor. So I put it in my waist. I walked up in the room with Shy. He had his headsets on, he was listening to his music. When I walked in there, a kid named Mo from DC was in the corner. I didn't know, but by the time I was in there, it was too late. Mo, it was Mo had to stay in there. He was locked in with this deal. I was getting ready to bring Shy, and so I kept hitting Shy up. And Shy, we, I mean, just had this look on his face as I was stabbing him up. He was, I blocked the door because it was only one way in and one way out. So I blocked the door so he couldn't get out. But Mo, at, at this time, Shy is bleeding out the neck, the chest. He's bleeding all over. Mo said, "You're gonna kill him and let me out of here. I don't want, I don't want this body." So I moved to the side and let Mo out. But that's as far, Mo can only go but so far because they already locked the other two gates. After I finished hitting Shy up, no cameras, I took the knife, I put it in my waist, and I walked out calmly because I knew I would be on, I knew at all times I would be on that camera. Shy was in the corner, hun huddled up. I don't know what he was, but somehow he he got up. And he had, a, and as he got up, he was, he was still like, he was trying to walk. And then when he got to the gate, 
to where it was locked, it was a trail of blood. He was screaming for the police and they came and hit the deuces. Me and the DC kid was sitting down. I tried, I tried to wash as much as blood because they had a little bathroom. I tried to wash, wash as much blood, but I couldn't get it all off. I had it in my fingernails and my head. Anyway, they uh let me ask you this. You got a 15-year sentence, you're in mm -hmm. federal prison, dude's like acting like he's gonna take over, so you gotta handle your business. Did it ever enter your mind like, damn, man, I might end up with a life sentence if I stab this kid over a box of fish? Well, it, it was the principle because, like I said, the missing piece was when I talked that I I didn't tell you guys because you know I didn't want to really draw the story out. And again, I'm not glorifying what it was, and it wasn't a box of fish. What happened is when I talked to his shot caller, I tried to rectify the situation. I guess they spoke to Shy. The next day, Shy approached me with a bluff, like he had his he had his hand in his pants. They say, yo, you got a problem. And he went, yo, yo, and he's pointing his finger and everything. And I don't know if he has a weapon. I didn't have a weapon. So I rocked him to sleep. I said, nah, nah. He said, don't ever mention my name. Don't let my name come out. He was feeling real good about himself because he, 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 he didn't have no weapon, though. So that's what really got shy, damn near killed. That move right there. He didn't have a weapon. And little but he do bluffed. people know, man. That New York car, man, that East Coast car goes hard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know something? You know, he had to wear a shit bag after that. He had a shit bag. Uh, the, th the thing about it is that they put him in a protective custody, and he wore a shit bag. And they moved him. I guess they, was, they decided to transfer him as well because they transferred me. I stayed in the hole for two years at Lewisburg with that. And let me tell you something. Anybody that watches your program that was in Lewisburg with me or in the hole with me will tell you. Two years, I went hard with the police there. Went hard. They used to come in that cell. And it wasn't just no nut out shit. I mean, they was just violating us in that hole. I mean, the hole was just rats, roaches. I mean... The, the, the conditions were so bad, so bad. They had this one pipe that hung in your cell, a pipe that you could heat your food up on. That's how hot that pipe was. If you touched it, you had burns. I mean, the conditions, I mean, you had to put holes in the walls, everything. So I, I spent two years in that hole in Lewisburg behind that initial was a stabbing, but it was mainly because of, the uh me and the CEOs going at it. I'm writing requests for conditions. I I mean I would do I would organize these hunger strikes. Um they had built a new hole and they transferred us up to the new hole. I organized a thing to where we smashed the windows in the new hole. Uh, so so they was eager to get me out of there after two years and the new warden they got me out of there and I ended up going to Laurel Park or Atlanta and then there on Coleman and I got into the situation with Coleman, but back to Big City, which you initially say your first day at Big City. So well, because the people are gonna want to know because you mentioned this thing at Lompoc. You stabbed someone in Lompoc. So once they no, that, Coleman they want to hear it. Coleman. Coleman. What happened in Coleman? Okay, so uh they had this Boston dude, and I I wanna say Steve. Was it Steve? Billy? Okay, so there was this Italian kid that came there and a uh, white kid and um, he had money. And this this kid, he was like 25 years old, Italian kid. What happened was he came- Talking about Bobby. Was his name Bobby from Boston? Dauphine. He got high, but he had big, big money. Act like he was in the mob. No, 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 not him, not, not Bobby. No, I know Bobby, no, no, no. This Billy, Billy, was it, what the hell was his name? Anyway. No, the kid, the Italian kid that had the money. No, I'm not talking about him. I, I kind of confused the story. Okay, so this kid gets there. And real quick, he was there for this. Okay, so he was flying from Paris to uh, Florida for coming back from Paris. But he was snorted up and he was high on the first class. So this was right after 9-11. It was the world was still sensitive after 9-11. So the kid is getting high. He gets in an argument because they won't serve him no more drinks in first class because he's obviously drunk. So he gets into an argument with the stewardess. The marshals that's riding the plane are undercover. They can't reveal themselves. But here's this kid in first class showing his ass. So the marshal gets up, doesn't say 
he is, but acts like a concerned uh, passenger. And he says, you know, why don't you just relax? You had too much to drink. The kid hooks off on him. Doesn't know he's a marshal. They had to make an emergency landing on that plane because of this kid. The judge was, didn't give a fuck who his father was because his father was some big real estate guy. Gave him five years in the feds. He comes to Coma. And that's when I he comes up. At this time, I'm one of the wine makers in this unit. I make all the wine, right? I got a loan shark. I, since Lewisburg, I always loan shark books. Every joy, even when I went to the media, I'm always loan shark. I always was hustling. So, so he gets there and I watch him because he's right across from me. I'm watching this kid every day. He's in a cell with a mafia guy, Patty. I forgot Patty, what family he belonged to. At this time, Patty was like 70 some years old. He was from one of the mafia families. Good man, good man. And uh, Patty never had a celly because, you know, in the USP, you don't have to have a celly. You know how you do it. But uh, uh, so Patty moves the kid in because he knew something about the kid's father or something. Anyway, Patty has a heart attack. He gets transferred out. I see the kid is buying wine. To make a long story short, I take to the kid and put him under my wing. Good kid. We work out together. We drinking together. I like the kid. The... Um, Boston guy, Billy, Billy. He's bald-headed. I cannot think of his name. Was it Billy Nothing. Brimer? Can't think of his name. But uh, one day he comes over and he's extorting the kid. Hannibal from Boston. The Hannibal was this black dude uh, from Boston. Good man. Me and Hannibal was like this. That was my main man. So I'm in myself drinking. And Hannibal comes into the cell. He said, yo, man, Billy, Billy, it had to be Billy. He said, yo, Billy pressing the pigeon, man. I go downstairs, Billy got my dude, Italian kid. He got, the, he got him in the corner by the phone. He's saying, give me the books, give me the book. I said, what's going on? He says, nah, it got nothing to do with you, B. I said, yo, what's up? I talked to the kid. He said, he wants 10 books. Because the kid, he had money, so he was always buying books. He was gambling, he was buying weed, he was buying this. He even got a cell phone. The kid had money unlimited. So the dude came from another unit from Boston. Kid, I'm thinking about to press him. So I say, nah, it ain't going down like that. He's under, he's under my protection. It ain't going down like that. He says, this got nothing to do with you. This is white business. So I said, oh, you you doing that? You playing that white card down? Because in Florida and Coleman, the blacks and, and the white Boston car, they was tight. They ran together. They fought together. They did a lot together. So, you know, I said, you playing that white card? He says, no, nah, I just want 10 books that I'm out of here. You're not getting nothing. You're not getting nothing. Screw away. Later on uh, that evening, I guess they was on the yard. They got into a fight. The kid from Boston approached him again and got into a fight. Went to the hole. When he, when he went to the hole, in his cell, the CO found heroin, weed, Tobacco, because they just stopped smoking when I was in Coleman. This was in 06, 05. They was just stopped smoking. They just, and I was, they just stopped it. So I think you couldn't have with so much. But this kid had everything. Weed, everything. The officer found everything. I was coming off the yard one day. Everybody in the unit handled was saying, yo, the police found all this stuff in your boy, the Italian kid's cell. I go over there. I see it. The, it, it's a 10 minute move. So the officer had just found it. He put in the office, locked the office to do the 10 minute move outside the unit. So I go upstairs to his office, look through the window and there's a stack of, I mean, this kid had books and stamps, blocks. He had everything in his locker. So I tell Hannibal, I say, yo, I'm taking all that shit. So Hannibal go, from the police? Here, yeah. when he come up here, I'm Debo on the head. Ask anybody in Coleman, if I, somebody will tell you, nah, he ain't lying. That shit was talked about for months. As soon as the 10-minute move was off, officer came back upstairs, unlocked, and he was doing his inventory. I calmly walked in. I said, yo, I need a request slip, man. He was sitting behind the desk. All stuff was on the desk. I just scooped it all up. He said, what you doing? I said, well, you can't. You know better than this. He said, what are you doing? So he went to rush me. Hannibal was waiting down the tickets. I'm on the top tier. So I take the officer with my arm, and he's a little guy. I push him back into the thing. Drop the bag off the tier. Hannibal catches the bag, goes into the cell. I'm getting to the point. I had to tell that story. They got none of that back. They didn't even lock me up because they had no room for it. He hit the deuces. They came. 
They brought me to a little. T- That's how wide open Coleman was. They didn't even put you in a hole for something like that. They have no room for me. So now the kid comes. They, they don't. The kid beats the case. This is what I'm getting to the point. So the kid beats the case. He comes out of the hole. They can't charge him. They never recover any of that stuff. You follow me? Let me let me say this right because I want people to understand what a maximum security federal prison was like back then. Mm-hmm. My first day in Big Sandy, one of the homies from New York, and I'm in the mm-hmm. unit with, with Lou, right, Lou Sims, and the New York dude slaps the CO. And I'm like, what? And everybody crowded Big around Jerry. Do you, you, you remember that? Big Jerry. Slaps him. He slaps the CO yeah. in the face. And the CO, says, the CO says, what did I do? What did I do? And everybody surrounds the CO, and I'm like, wow. This is Big Sandy. So people don't realize, man, people rough the cops off at times, man, a lot of times. Oh, man. Cops had no control. See, now, when I was saying about Big Sandy, the thing about it, that was the only institution I've ever been in that the administration compromised. I mean, totally compromised. If you went to the hole, Chad, you was in the hole. I went to, this is how it was done. This is how the politics of Big Sandy was. You went to the hole for cussing the police out. I went to the captain. I said, Captain, get Chad up out that hole. He said, he cussed my officer out, tried to spit on him. I got him. I will reprimand him. Take him out. He said, I don't want no more shit out of him. And they pulled you out the hole the next day. That's how it used to work. Like, we would police ourselves. You know what I mean? Like, yo, they would come. The cops come and say, hey, man, this dude's in your car, man. You guys got to handle that because the cops don't want to deal with it. The administration don't want to deal with it. And there's been plenty of times where, you know, dudes had to get their heads kicked in, right? Where the administration allows you, yo, look, man, you got a dude here. You guys do what you got to do. Next thing you know, the dude's leaving on a stretcher. That incident, what you was talking about, I, I remember it's, it's the same one. It was Big Jerry, and they was playing poker, and it was they had the table clothed up. I guess the officer was like, you can't, guys can't do this, because they had the stamps and everything. So Big Jerry was losing. He was frustrated. So the officer came back around again and said, I told you guys to wrap it up. Put that stuff away. Big jury got up and said, yo, we got L's. We got life up in here. And you're going to tell us what we can't play? And he slapped him. But the thing about it, Jerry was just coming back in the system. He was an old timer that everybody knew. Because back he, he, when, he, when, when he slapped that officer, come, that was his second round in the feds. He was like 60-something years old, but he, he didn't look it. He was a giant. He was like 6'4", 283, close to three. And he was a giant. But um, when he did that, everybody, including the DC car, because of who he was, when they hit the deuces, nobody went in their cells. They stood behind Jerry. Like that whole unit said, it's your call, Jerry. The police was on a standoff. And if it wasn't for Jerry, he didn't want nobody else getting in trouble. Jerry said, nah, I'll go with him. Because they wasn't going to let the officers take Jerry out the unit. They were going to go with the officers. And that's how Big Sandy was, you know. Big Sandy was like unbelievable. I heard you on one of your shows one time. I guess you guys were talking about an incident and it was like one of the worst incidents you were talking about. And it was a stabbing. Um, Two incidents in my three years at Sandy. Two incidents that for me was like, wow. That was with the Texas ABs and the Cali ABs. That was a bloodbath like never seen. 